Thank you so much. I, um, I am honored to be here, and I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, come and speak with you today. Uh, I note that Ron Bloom was the inaugural speaker of this series, and uh, I appreciate uh, Ron Bloom for what he did to help rescue the American auto industry. Uh, today in Lordstown, Ohio, uh, GM is building the Chevy Cruze. My wife just purchased one the other day. Three shifts a day. They're even doing it on Saturdays. Jobs are being created there. In Toledo, Ohio, Chrysler is making major multi-million dollar investments. None of that would have happened had uh, the American auto industry be allowed to wither and die. And so I uh, feel honored to be standing where Ron Bloom stood not, uh, not too long ago. Let me say to you that much of what I'm going to say to you today is my opinion. And, um, you know, there's a risk in just using your opinion when you're talking to a group of academics. Uh, so I just wanted to point that out and be candid about that. But to tell you that uh, those opinions that I will share with you today come from my experience as a 12-year uh, member of the House of Representatives and as the governor of Ohio. Um, and finally, I'm going to ask you to be tolerant of my focus on Ohio uh, because in spite of our challenges, I am very proud of my state and there are a few people here who have Ohio roots. Uh, and uh, so, thank you. Uh, it can't be done. A man might as well try to fly. That was a common put down, a quick way to dismiss a powerful and optimistic idea. It was a taunt that Orville and Wilbur Wright knew very well because, uh, as Wilbur put it, men had by common consent adopted human flight as the standard of impossibility. Across the ages, many great minds had tried to solve the problem of flight before conceding defeat. But against the impossible, a humble pair of Ohioans who sold hand-built bicycles for a living triumphed. Now, how did they do it? Well, the Wright brothers studied everything written on the subject. They stared at birds for hours and hours at a time. They tinkered with their designs during sleepless nights in their bicycle shop. But more than anything, they made history because they were willing to accept the cost of believing in the future. John Daniels was one of a handful of assistants who helped Orville and Wilbur Wright set up their plane at Kitty Hawk that famous December day in 1903. Almost everyone who knew what the Wright brothers were trying to do, uh, among them, Daniels was one of the most supportive and yet, before he actually saw it happen before his very eyes, Daniel said he couldn't help but thinking that they were nuts. <laughs> but it turned out those nuts could fly, and those nuts changed the world. They laid the foundation for modern flight, and they made Ohio an international center of aviation research and production. On a foundation they built a century ago, Ohio today is home to 1,200 aerospace firms that together employ more than 100,000 Ohioans. Today, Ohio is the largest supplier of parts to Airbus and the second largest supplier to Boeing. And NetJets operates the world's largest private jet fleet from Columbus, Ohio. So that's the legacy of two Ohioans puttering away in a Dayton bicycle shop more than 110 years ago. Two Ohioans who refused to accept the cold comforts of a cynical life. And similar stories now have led to the development of other industries so that today Ohio is home to more than 21,000 manufacturing companies. Currently, our country is being torn between two competing views about how we got here and competing strategies 
about how best to move forward. Now, this conflict may not be one that any of us would have sought or wished to face, but face it we must. Brought on by a multitude of causes, Wall Street greed, the lax regulation of our financial sector, and a culture that deifies short-term profit above long-term planning and growth. The financial cr crash of 2008 sparked the seemingly unending combustion of the Great Recession. The financial sector is exacerbating that problem by profiting from speculation. And while the challenges of American manufacturing can't be blamed on this crisis, the Great Recession's severity is both exacerbating the challenge and increasing the need for bold, urgent public response if we are to save this vital part of our nation's economy. Now, I say that to you today, understanding fully that there are many who do not see manufacturing as essential to a growing and a prosperous America. They believe that markets exist to efficiently produce products, and if those products can be made more cheaply elsewhere, then our nation will benefit as a whole, even if some regions and some citizens suffer as a result. I personally believe such arguments are both intellectually flawed and morally vacant. I came from a part of the country that invented modern America. Midwestern factories powered the nation from the frontier to the industrial age and into the first American century. Our steel framed the towering spires of skyscrapers from New York to Chicago and into the New West. Our mechanical ingenuity powered us into human flight and allowed us to explore spaces beyond the Earth's own atmosphere. Although the Midwestern ethos is inherently humble, it would be false modesty of me to not acknowledge these accomplishments. We Ohioans and others from the Midwestern industrial part of our state can take quiet pride in America's achievements. For us, manufacturing is deeply personal. For every car, we see workers who produce it and the families who depend upon it. For every building, we see the people who form molten steel into solid straight beams. For every bridge, we see the men and women who worked at great heights and sometimes did not come home. And as patriotic citizens, we see a nation that is safer, more prosperous, and more secure because of American manufacturing and the American worker. So perhaps you can understand why I believe manufacturing was essential to the development of the country as we know it. But what about our future? In this speech, I have two goals. First, I will offer an argument for why we should care about improving the state of American manufacturing. This argument I believe to be based on moral values as well as a realistic understanding of what drives our economic system. Second, I will offer an approach for strengthening American manufacturing by reviewing for you how my administration attempted to revive it in my own state. In my family, we all knew how to work hard. Work was what we did. Work was our way to eat, to keep ourselves in a house, to stay warm, to look ourselves in the mirror and gain the respect of the people we loved. It is often said that America was built on ingenuity, on genius, and the risk-taking of the investor. And while no one should diminish the importance of those things, our country was built brick by brick, microchip by microchip, nano by nano, by the hands and the hearts of its workers. To fail to recognize that truth is to believe the malignant lie that only the investor class matters that the facts of history, as well as the narrative of history, is crafted only by those with the resources to purchase their share of the future. But to deny the essential contributions of the worker is to deny ourselves 
delude ourselves into denying the importance of the common man and woman and what they have given us, prosperity and freedom. In the 1700s, while Europe convulsed under the monarchy uh, and class chaos that existed there, Americans rose up in favor of a radical new form of government, one in which the Constitution guaranteed democratic representation, rule of law, and individual rights. Working people built our nation, its cities, its roads and railroads, and its factories. Others may have provided the resources, but money alone cannot form steel out of hard rock and fire. Only human hands and human intellect can do that. Money alone could not span the continent for the movement of trains. Only human heart and muscle could do so. Today, even though our factories are models and wonders of technology and automation, Things that are made are touched and are guided into being by people, hardworking people, middle class people, the everyday heroes that made us a nation worthy of its highest ideals. Now, the business person may ask, as someone competing in a global economy, what relevance does a healthy American middle class have to me? Well, first, as I've already pointed out to you, it's important to acknowledge that our working middle class made modern America possible. Second, because aggregate demand is crucial to economic growth, a healthy and a vibrant middle class is the only way to sustain a growing and expanding American economy into the future. So we should all be concerned when the system no longer works for these people. Put bluntly, when our economic and our political system no longer work for America's middle class, the American people will no longer be able to support our economic and our political system. Indeed, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, nearly 70% of gross domestic product is driven by consumer spending, and 62% of American employment can be traced back to consumer spending. These are the fundamental facts of our economy. These are the fundamental facts of our economy that are frequently overlooked. Now, a conservative pundit may argue that economic growth simply leaps from the pockets of beneficent investment bankers, that all our innovations all our iPads and Chevy Volts, our uh, Microsoft Windows, everything from Boeing jets um, to um, advanced computers really result from the largesse of banks and venture capitalists. But here's the simple truth as I see it. Companies that make products make money by selling those products. And of course, to sell those products, companies require what we all know as customers, people who want to buy those products and can afford to do so. Now, this may seem so fundamental that it isn't necessary to mention. But if one looks at the focus of our economic policy, the political debate in Washington, and the obsession of the media, you would think we live in a completely different world one in which all of our economic health could be encapsulated by the anxious movement of pieces of paper on Wall Street. Of course, investment is important. Businesses need money to grow and to adapt to the demands of consumers. But the world we presently live in puts truth to the lie that the needs of investors equate entirely to the needs of the economy. I believe we need to take a more proportional approach. The investment class can make do, in my judgment, without having a complete monopoly over economic policy. In fact, as Rutgers historian James Livingston recently argued in the New York Times, and I quote him, 
Consumer spending is not only the key to economic recovery in the short term, it is also necessary for a balanced growth in the long term. If our goal is to repair our damaged economy, we should bank on the consumer culture. And that entails a redistribution of income away from profits toward wages, enabled by tax policy and enforced by government spending. Now, what would our e economic policy look like if we were to focus on workers and consumers instead of just the financial sector? Well, I believe our primary responsibility would be creating new jobs. We continue today to suffer the longest and the deepest economic recession since the Great Depression. It's a recession that is having not only devastating impacts upon our economy, but on our families, on our communities, and of course on workers themselves. Both the magnitude of the unemployment rate and its duration are unprecedented in contemporary times. This is quite frankly a crisis. It's a crisis that I believe in many ways is an invisible crisis. I think it's invisible because many of the political and the financial elites don't seem to feel it. This silent, invisible crisis of the American middle class is one in which unemployment stalks one's dreams, stagnating wages make everyday life harder, and those with power or influence don't seem to care. Case in point, there is an obsession with protecting the advantages enjoyed by the wealthy and a fixation on cutting exactly the kind of investments that could help our economy recover. It is now clear that the 2009 stimulus probably needed to be double in size in order to spur real economic growth. Now, I'm not talking about interfering in the everyday marketplace. But I am talking about adopting a comprehensive set of policies and programs that revitalize American manufacturing and prepare it for the rest of the 21st century. The reasons for that are simple. Manufacturing has been at the core of American invention, innovation, design, and security. Manufacturing jobs pay better than service jobs. A recent study by the Institute for America's Future points out that service jobs pay no more than 75 cents for every dollar paid for production jobs, and retail pays only 50 cents. Manufacturing, or the lack of it, is at the heart of our trade deficit. Products we don't make must be imported. Products that we do make can be purchased here and exported. Manufacturing holds the solution to our infrastructure problems. Whether it's roads or bridges, rail, air, or public transportation, someone has to produce the equipment. The question is, will it be us or will it be others? Manufacturing can be a key component to the solutions to global climate change. The United States, I believe, has the potential to design, to build, and to produce the technologies that make better use of our natural resources and to do so in ways that protect and improve our environment. Whether it's clean coal, nuclear, wind, solar, hydro, fuel cells, next generation batteries, or energy efficiency, we can make it here. It's exciting to think about our country and our workers inventing and manufacturing the solutions needed to meet the world's needs. Of course, establishing a national industrial policy is a controversial subject. Some people argue that the government should play no role in such a free market economy as we have. Industrial policy has become something to be scorned in Washington, while China, Germany, and much of the developed and developing world have seen it as a tool for achieving economic dominance. Nearly 50 years ago, however, 
even conservatives turned a blind eye to their ideological dogma in the name of national security and supported pouring money into the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA. DARPA was created in part as a response to the launch of Sputnik. And the result was positive for our civilian economy as well as the defense establishment. Breakthroughs occurred, such as the internet, that spurred growth throughout our economy and allowed us to take a leadership position in key sectors of the global economy. But unfortunately, with the exception of DARPA and defense, most other agencies left commercialization to the private sector. We can only imagine what could have been achieved if over those decades the entire governmental enterprise had worked in full partnership with the private sector in moving our economy forward. Unfortunately, over the last decades, we have not had a serious national discussion about this topic. But some of us, some of us can remember the 1984 presidential campaign when several of the Democratic candidates were strong industrial policy advocates, including the eventual Democratic nominee, Walter Mondale. Ronald Reagan, on the other hand, was an opponent. So after Reagan's reelection, the debate effectively came to an end. However, and I think this is perhaps incredibly significant, but not, not understood by a lot of people. Although President Reagan did not support the adoption of an industrial policy, a national industrial policy, certain tax and trade legislation that was adopted under President Reagan actually led to an acceleration of deindustrialization, resulting in the loss of our core industrial base through plant closings and capital flight. Now you can fast forward to today and calls for industrial policy are once again finding their way onto our editorial pages and into congressional hearing rooms. So if we were to develop a robust industrial policy, what would we need to address? Creating demand and the conditions to increase demand. It will be the public sector that carries out infrastructure rebuilding. It will be the public sector that provides incentives for cleaner energy technologies, advanced material production, and other emerging technologies. But it will be the private sector that makes those products. We must prepare the workforce of the present and the future. There's really no debate that education is the key to building a healthy economy. That means that American education must not only improve in quality, but it must improve in accessibility and affordability. And that can be achieved through combining cost controls and having healthy incomes. Identifying and building upon existing strengths Despite the gloom of this recession, Americans still come up with great product ideas. They innovate in their workplaces, and we do many things better than can be done anywhere in the world. We cannot allow those advantages to migrate offshore. In 2008, President Obama told the U.S. Conference of Mayors, and I quote, now is not the time for small plans. Now is the time for bold action to rebuild and to renew America. And it has to happen at all levels. As a governor of a Midwest state, you might rightly expect me to feel passionately about the importance of cultivating American manufacturing. But you can ask, what can government really do to spur such an ailing sector of our economy? And today I'd like to share with you how I approach the problem. When I took office, I asked my lieutenant governor to head the Ohio Department of Development, and I gave him the charge of drafting Ohio's very first long-range strategic economic plan. The plan he delivered had three primary goals, growing income, creating and retaining jobs, 
expanding productivity through innovation. So, guided by this strategic plan and working with local partners and entrepreneurs and businesses, my administration decided to establish hubs of innovation in each of Ohio's main metropolitan areas. Building upon these regional strengths, these hubs served the twin purpose of sparking research and entrepreneurship as well as advertising the skilled workforce and innovation that exists in these areas to the larger world. As examples, we designated Dayton, Ohio as a hub for aviation and aerospace, Cleveland as a hub for healthcare and biomedicine, Toledo as a hub for solar energy, Cincinnati as a hub for consumer marketing and research, Akron as a hub for biomaterials and advanced polymers, Columbus as a hub for advanced energy and storage, and Youngstown as a hub for advanced materials commercialization. Now, none of these designations were chosen at random. Each was arrived at through a rigorous process of identifying a region's inherent strengths. For example, Cincinnati, because it is the home of Procter & Gamble, perhaps the world's most successful provider of household products, is unequaled in their ability to understand consumer needs, to actualize those needs into useful products, and to market those products effectively. Now, we're told that today, Mother Earth will achieve its seven billionth person. Procter & Gamble tells us that approximately 4.2 billion people use one of their products every day. So obviously, it just made sense that Cincinnati was designated as a hub for consumer marketing. Now, of course, simply designating a region would be meaningless if it was not backed up by substantial investment. What this approach allowed my administration to do was coordinate the hundreds of millions in state resources that already flowed into economic development, but to do so in a way that supported each region's strategic plans. In addition to already existing resources, my administration also used our bonding authority to provide more than $1.6 billion for job creation in new and emerging industries. We provided more than $900 million to help rebuild and renovate our infrastructure, $250 million for workforce development, and over $400 million to invest in projects related specifically to the regional hubs of innovation. In addition, my administration successfully renewed and expanded a program started by my predecessor called the Ohio Third Frontier perhaps the most unique such program in the country. This $2.3 billion collaborative between the government and the private sector aims to commercialize groundbreaking research, sparking new businesses and possibly even new industries based on innovations taking place in Ohio's laboratories and university. Specifically, the program provides entrepreneurial assistance, early stage capital formation, and investment in a skilled workforce that can support technology-based economic growth. And by the way, this money is only used for research projects and investments that are thoroughly vetted by outside vetters. It's not a pork barrel, politically driven effort. But you know, we didn't stop there. When I came to Ohio, or came to office, I was faced with the fact that Ohio had adopted an extremely ill-conceived electricity deregulation bill. And as states such as Maryland and Illinois had already discovered such a, free a freewheeling approach stuck businesses and uh, customers with skyrocketing energy prices. At the same time, it was clear to me that there was an energy revolution underway and that states and regions stood to capture significant economic growth in the coming decades if, if 
they adopted the right policies. So to make sure Ohio was positioned to take advantage of that opportunity, I proposed and signed into law one of the most far-reaching energy bills in the nation. First of all, we brought back common sense electricity regulation that made sure that our businesses and our consumers had access to stable electricity prices. Second, we set very strong standards for the development of new energy sources, including solar, wind, and other advanced technologies. We did that by mandating that by the year 2025, that at least 25% of all the electricity sold in Ohio should come from renewable and advanced energy sources. And we also mandated the strongest energy efficient standard in the nation. We did these things believing that government can be the catalyst for industrial innovation and expansion. Did it work? Well, according to Conway data, Ohio has the most renewable and advanced energy manufacturing projects in the nation. In fact, according to a Pew study, Ohio has more than 2,500 companies working in clean energy. And Ohio is home to the largest thin film solar manufacturing plant in the country and to the development of the most powerful fuel cell in the world. And that research is going on at Stark State Community College. And Dr. O'Donnell, who was the president and has recently relocated here to Massachusetts, is largely responsible for that collaboration between Stark State Community College and um, uh, Rolls-Royce, Rolls-Royce. In the near future, Ohio will have the largest solar farm east of the Rocky Mountains, 500 acres of formerly strip mined land will be covered with solar panels, uh, a project by a Spanish company that is coming to Ohio, building a manufacturing plant to create those solar panels. And those solar panels will be built in Ohio by Ohio workers. Would not have happened if we had not established a renewable standard within our energy bill. But clearly, and I've heard this as I've talked to many of you today, manufacturing can't be revived without focusing on the skills and education levels of the workforce. And so we took an education system that in many respects was designed to help young people thrive in the 1800s, and we remade it for modern students in the modern economy. We dumped a funding system that had been found unconstitutional by our state Supreme Court, and in its place, the state must assume responsibility for an unprecedented share of the cost of our schools, and our schools must accept unprecedented financial accountability for the dollars we invest. At its core, our education reform was designed to put critical thinking, problem solving, and creativity at the center of the school day. And to encourage this, we established a center for creativity and innovation within our Department of Education. We did this because success in life requires more than memorizing times tables. We have to challenge our children not only to answer old questions, but to ask new ones. This innovative and creatively focused educa education approach is essential to educating the kinds of workers needed in modern and high-tech manufacturing. Indeed, I believe if we are not successful in changing how we educate, all our other efforts will be unsuccessful. Um, our education reform did provide, and this is important, I think, the most progressive teacher training, teacher quality, and teacher career path in the nation. Every teacher, every new teacher, required to undergo a four-year internship before they acquire their professional teaching license. Quite frankly, under my plan, a student graduating from our schools would have learned from the best trained and best supported teachers in the country. 
Our education reform creatively measured academic progress against the standards set by the best students in the nation and the world. The student having graduated from our schools will have demonstrated not only comprehension but the ability to solve problems and make connections between bits of information. And we took home an award, an award from the respected nonpartisan Education Commission of the States for having the best education reform plan in the nation. More important, in my administration, we saw Ohio schools leap over 22 other schools to claim a spot among the top five school systems in the country, according to Education Week. For older students, we froze college tuition for two years in exchange for additional resources going into our university system. We did that at a time when some state systems were increasing tuition 15, 20, and even more, 15 percent, 20 percent, even more. We made it possible for every Ohioan to complete a four-year degree within 30 miles of where they live in Ohio. We directed more resources into our community college system, and we consolidated our workforce development programs under the Ohio Board of Regents to bring uh, some kind of reasonable um, direction to workforce development. And of course, we took these actions to improve the skills and the education levels of our workforce. So why do we, where do we go from here? <clears throat> a vigorous national debate is already underway. I personally believe the federal government must step up and take actions at the national level that parallel what we tried to accomplish in Ohio. Will it cost money? Yes, it will. But we found that much of the money could come from targeting existing resources to support our economic development principles. And those principles were growing income, creating and retaining jobs, and increasing productivity through innovation. Some investments, obviously, are less controversial than others. Most can agree that the federal government should invest in our nation's infrastructure and to do so in ways that utilize American workers American manufacturing, and American innovation. But other investments are equally important but more controversial, such as research into low-carbon technologies, both those at near deployment stage and those requiring longer-term exploration. I'm encouraged that the Obama administration understands the federal government's legitimate role in incentivizing promising yet unproven technologies that could be pivotal to Ohio's economic future. Unfortunately, today, Solandra is the example we see most often in the press. The administration may have picked the wrong company, but it had the right idea. When you fund unproven technologies, you have to expect that there will be some failures. This reality should not discourage us from continuing such efforts. And in conclusion, let me be just a little political since I'm a political person. Let me say we must stand against the pervasive efforts across the country to undermine the basic rights of employees, both public and private, to collectively bargain with their employers. You may know that in just a few days, on November the 8th, Ohioans will vote on whether or not to repeal the most anti-worker law passed in the entire country. You won't be surprised to hear that I support the repeal. But more critically for the nation, the campaign to support this bill has demonized firefighters and police officers and nurses and teachers and all other public employees. It is more explicit but no more damaging than our society's current devaluing of the worth of manual work and factory work. I believe that while I was governor, I did everything possible to develop new businesses and to strengthen existing businesses in Ohio. But I am deeply driven by the belief that we must once again value and take pride in the daily efforts of working and middle-class Americans, the people who actually built this land into the richest and strongest nation on earth. 
And I believe manufacturing is the path back to that future. We must rebuild an economy that allows people to tell their children with pride, I created that. I built that. I made that work. That's what the Wright brothers did. You know, that first plane that flew, it had no seats. It had no shield to keep the bugs out of the face of the pilot. The controls weren't very reliable, and the pilot had to steer the back rudder with his hips. That plane could stay airborne only briefly, and I'm told traveled all of seven miles an hour. In fact, Orville and Wilbur's plane would have lost a race with a train or a horse or a person, for that matter. But they gave the world its first machine that could lift itself from the ground in free flight. And they knew that it would be the foundation of things to come. For Wilbur said, and I quote, we're just doing our little bit to help the future worker who will attain the final success. The invention of the airplane changed the world. But the greatest lesson the Wright brothers taught us was not how to fly. It was how to live. Because when the doubters said, a man might as well try to fly, they did. Thank you. Or suggestions. <laughs> or suggestions. <laughs> and I'm sure that you could just pull on people. Sure. Well, I'd be happy to hear what you have to say. And it doesn't have to be a question. It can be a suggestion. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, I mean, a very specific question. Uh, you mentioned that you were talking about investments in early stage in technology, innovation, and companies. And you said you used an external review. What sort of process did you put in place to try to get the input from a wide variety of different people in terms of what investments to make? Um, the, the, the uh, I mean, there were criteria in place. Um, and, at, you know, as I said regarding the Salandra thing, um, you, you, you try to invest in things that you think are going to be uh, successful. But you understand that, that when you're doing research, especially, and when you're doing early stage investment, there are going to be failures. Um, but we, we were determined that this program would be different from most other governmental programs, incentive, you know, incentivizing programs uh, that, that frequently became so politicized that they lost their meaning and their focus. And um, one of the ways we were able to get the people of Ohio to agree to this level of indebtedness was to convince them that this was going to be a different kind of program. And uh, so we chose the National Science Foundation to, uh, to review all of, the, uh, all of the grant applications. Now, they did not make a final solution, but, but if they, uh, quite frankly, uh, uh, indicated uh, serious doubts about the legitimacy of, uh, of the proposal, it was not likely to go anywhere. And then, and then we, had a, we had a bipartisan uh, um, com you know, committee that made the final um, decision. Um, doctor, did, did Stark State get money from the Third Frontier? I uh, yes, we received uh, extensive uh, investment in uh, uh, at Stark State College, uh, Community College in Ohio, we received... By the way, Stark State Community College, under his leadership, was the fastest-growing community college in the nation. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Uh, influenced by a certain level of public policy from the governor, <laughs> which I can talk about. Uh, we received uh, extensive investment from the uh, Third Frontier to establish on-campus partnerships at a community college in uh, clean energy, uh, fuel cell research and development. And uh, as the governor said, uh, vetted by the National Science Foundation, and uh, it was highly competitive. And even although my local senator was on the commission, I had no access or guarantee of funding. It was a wonderful process. Hi, 
Hi. Hi. Um, I've been relatively involved with Occupy Boston and the Occupy Wall Street mm. movement. Um, I've also been following your career for a few years. I'm from Missouri, and I've been really interested in your, yeah. I guess, trajectory as a political figure, and I, I really like a lot of things you've done. Um, so I guess I'm asking for a suggestion what you think the relevance of the Occupy movement is, um, and whether you think it's productive, or if in the end you think it'll accomplish anything, or if you have suggestions on how it might. Well, uh, interesting questions. I, um, uh, my personal feeling is that I, I hope it has staying power. Um, also, my personal opinion is that it is the result of a, a growing frustration that has developed not only recently, but has developed over an extended period of time, even years. Um, whether or not it's, you know, it has a, a major impact upon public policy, I think is yet to be determined. Um, I, I am not troubled, as you know, some commentators seem to be, that there's not a specific uh, agenda and a specific set of goals that they hope to achieve. Uh, I think it's really good when citizens engage themselves in the political process in, in a variety of ways, certainly voting and advocating and supporting candidates or opposing candidates, but also, you know, going to the street and, uh, and uh, expressing their grievances. I think that's healthy. Uh, and so I think some, some positive uh, results could, um, could come out of the, move, uh, the movement. I, I, hope it, I hope it grows. Um, and um, uh, I, it's been a long time since I've participated in a demonstration, but I've been tempted to, to, uh, tempted to go. Yes. As the governor said, uh, I just returned from Ohio, having spent eight years there as a community college president. And uh, I don't have questions for the governor, because uh, he answered most of them for me very nicely while I was there. But I'd like to give you, uh, uh, if I can briefly, uh, uh, the impact of uh, public policy that, that is aimed at changing a state economically and fundamentally changing where it is in terms of education and workforce. So I went to Stark uh, County in Ohio, uh, Greater Stark County, 600,000 people, economically and socially devastated by the loss of industry and jobs. We were a small community college in 2004, 5,600 students. And we set the goal and started moving towards it of uh, building a world-class workforce saying that the associate degree was the basis of the new skill set. And we grew that college at 10% a year. Uh, the governor came in with an educational policy that brought accountability to education. And I know a lot of academics might immediately say, goodness, what does that do? But the accountability was simply grow enrollment, populist movement, get people to college and graduate them and make them ready for jobs. Uh, under the governor and his policy, which for community colleges rewarded with funding, growing enrollment and student success, that is graduating and continuing through the process, we grew our college over those eight years, accelerated the growth from 5,600 students to 16,000 this fall. So we were well on our way to becoming the most educated county in Ohio. But we realized we could only attract those students. It was very fundamental. Yes, they were there for an education. Yes, to earn a degree. There had to be a job at the end. So we got into a philosophy and a mode of action. It's very diff different for community colleges. We decided to be a, uh, a partner in job creation with research universities, but with corporations. The third frontier provided us the funds to establish an on-campus commercialization site that attracted Rolls-Royce Fuel Cell North America. And eventually, Rolls-Royce Fuel Cell Global, researching and creating a, uh, a one megawatt fuel cell system for placement 
and the grid. Uh, we project there will be 200 manufacturing jobs in two to three years because of that project. And given that, we became the center for economic development. We attracted other partnerships. Uh, we partnered with Lockheed Martin and a small fuel cell company and won the contract for the military generation power set, fuel cell based, on campus at a community college. Uh, we received, competing with three research universities, again funded uh, uh, by the Third Frontier to work with Timken Corporation in creating a research and development center for wind turbine bearings. Uh, VP behind that at Timken, uh, MIT grad, uh, Doug Smith. Mm -hmm. And so one brought another. And we have extensive about seven major partnerships and all aimed at job creation. And finally, as a college president, I have to play to the faculty in academic governance. Uh, we, we not only grew the number of students, but we doubled the number of faculty and staff. So <laughs> that was the impact of the governor's public policy. And we lost him to Massachusetts. <laughs> Two questions. One, just following up on this. Now that you're at Massachusetts, what are you going to do for us? <laughs> <laughs> how, how can we build uh, some sort of collaboration between MIT and you at, at Massachusetts? Oh, I'll okay. answer that. Well, I, I, I you might answer that. If you would like. Uh, you know, I was saying to the governor that I really feel that what uh, Governor Duval Patrick mm -hmm. and Commissioner Freeland mm -hmm. Uh, have brought about with the uh, vision project in Massachusetts is the same kind of transformational ethos that government can intervene and facilitate pro pro uh, progress, which is a great debate in Ohio. There are those who think government should be small and passive. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the vision project is a major way to sustain Massachusetts' position as the most educated state in the nation, and as the most innovative state in terms of developing new industries. And uh, uh, we intend to grow our college. We intend to partner uh, with all in Metro West. And we're already looking at how we can do uh, small business incubators and a venture capital system, which we also started at Stark State. Will it translate to Massachusetts? I do not know. Uh, MIT could surely help us uh, evolve that. And uh, because as a community college, going on the governor's model of putting education in the driver, and uh, as a driver, it's the advocacy for resources to drive that partnership of corporate and university research. I think it can be done in Massachusetts and the community colleges. I have a question for you, uh, Governor Strickland. I, I know that states are competing for companies, and uh, that uh, you know when Cisco told us uh, that uh, they tried to find out which state would create you know more resources and community colleges for its, or when we see the global foundry moving into Upper New York State, and obviously there's a lot about that that just <coughs> might seem negative, but still that is the world as it is, and we see countries competing for companies too. I wonder, what's your approach to this, and how did you, as governor, try to deal with these, this competition for, for location? Yeah, the competition is severe, and sometimes it becomes highly political. I mean, uh, I mean I'm just gonna speak candidly here. Uh, Mitch Daniels of Indiana is kind of viewed as you know the ultimate successful governor. Um, but in head-to-head -head competitions, we beat Indiana big time. But <laughs> we, weren't, we weren't terribly successful in, you know, in promoting that national image as he was. So I congratulate him for doing that. Um, but I, you know, I think there is something destructive when our attempt is just simply to steal someone else's factory or someone else's job force 
workforce uh, rather than creating something new and expanding. Uh, and, but, but I can tell you uh, as governor that you are confronted almost continuously with uh, pleas uh, to, to help us, you know, help us with tax incentives, help us with grants, help us in, in, you know, in this way or that, or that way, or um, North Carolina is offering something better. Um, I got beat up on big time politically because NCR uh, left Dayton, Ohio, and uh, went, went to Georgia. Now, the fact is that NCR had been leaving Dayton, Ohio for many, many years. They just happened to turn out the lights while I was governor. So I was blamed for the entire <laughs> shift of, of, of uh, employment and so on and so forth. But it, it is, it, it is um, it's, a, it's a politically uh, difficult thing to deal with. And you have to find that balance between uh, providing legitimate incentives and, and just, just trying to outbid someone who's, uh, because ultimately, you know, that can become very destructive. It can be very destructive to a state's tax base. And, and here again, speaking candidly, I think, I think there's some uh, things happening in Ohio right now that are, that, that are a little more than shakedowns of the, of, of the, of the state government. And, um, and, and it's increasing. Uh, because Bob Evans said, we'll, we'll go to Texas if we don't get, uh, you know, major tax advantages to relocate our headquarters in Columbus, Ohio. So they're moving their headquarters eight or ten miles. They're getting uh, about $17 million of state assistance. And would they have gone to Texas? I don't think they would have. Um, but oftentimes political people are afraid to take, take the risk. Um, but there are legitimate reasons for, for the government to make investments, and we talked earlier today about workforce training. Uh, I think that's very legitimate, and certainly working with community colleges. Um, and, and I agree. I think, I think our education policy demonstrated that we felt, as, as you do, Doctor, that the, that the community college system uh, can provide a large part of the answer to uh, our employment problem. Um, there, are, there are many students who won't choose to or won't need to get a four-year degree or a, a, a graduate degree, um, but they need more than they've gotten from their high school. Uh, and um, the community college system is, is, you know, is where it ought to happen. But the community college system, for those who want to go on, um, you know, can can be that step between high school and, and, and a full university degree. The community college system, I'm so proud of ours in Ohio. We have 23 community colleges. Um, and as I said to someone earlier, some of our community colleges are so, so quite beautiful and impressive in terms of just the physical structures that uh, some states would you know, be happy to say this is our major state university. They're, they're, they're just magnificent. And, uh, I inherited that as governor. I didn't create that. Uh, those community college decisions were made long before I came on the scene. But it's a magnificent system and, uh, and, and can provide a large part of the answer to the workforce problem. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you for really a, a wonderful speech. And, and you, were, you were very complete. And, and you really covered a lot of the things that, 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 are, that are important to us. And, and I want to thank you for that. And wanted to follow up on Suzanne's question on the competition between states, and particularly with respect to organized labor. You made a, a, several times you made the point that there needs to be a careful balance between wages and profits. And uh, the strength of organized labor and the unions in the upper Midwest and in, in the southeastern states, I think is, is something yes. that I'd like to ask you about. And as we're going around the world, for example, in Germany, we're seeing quite a different relationship between um, the workforce and management. It seems to be a less sharp distinction uh, in, in some cases because of laws that exist there. Uh, workers uh, take part in management decisions which potentially lead to longer term thinking. So. How do you think we can move forward in this country on, on those issues? 
Yeah, it's a huge, a huge issue. And, uh, you know, as a Democratic governor in, in a Midwestern state, uh, I'm, uh, you know, I'm continuously confronted with the argument that um, right to work states are more attractive for investment. And that's why, you know, the Southeast and the, and the uh, certain parts of the country are doing much better than the than, than Midwest. You know, I, I think there are trade offs. Um, I, I continue to believe that a state like Ohio has the best workforce. Um, and, if, and, if, and if that kind of skill level is important to a company, then that can help offset our education system, I think is hugely better than the education, the public systems that exist in some of the states that are uh, considered attractive for, for uh, manufacturing investments and so on. Um, but, you know, it is an issue. Part of it is, is based upon apocryph apocryphal uh, anecdotal uh, information and stories. And, um, uh, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to get really personal here. Um, um, the, 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 the CEO of, of NCR lived in New York City. And um, he, w he, he was a fairly new CEO that led to the final decision. But um, he never in, involved himself in the life of Dayton, Ohio, like the former CEO had. You know, he didn't give to you know charitable uh, uh, appeals and so on and so forth. And um, and I just don't think he wanted to be in Ohio. I don't think he liked Dayton. And and he developed a, a good relationship with uh, I think Haley Barber. They were they played golf together and so on and so forth. And um, and, and so sometimes. Sometimes decisions are made based on existing biases. I mean, you know, there are some people who just do not believe in organized labor. They think that's a, a detriment. It interferes with their decision making as a business and so on. And so they're just going to be biased toward going somewhere where organized labor is not as prevalent as it is in Ohio or Michigan or some other states. Um, but uh, I, th I think there are advantages to having a strongly organized workforce, and um, it, it's it, it's it, it it is an issue, though. I mean, you're absolutely right with your question. I don't have a specific answer for you, uh, other than to acknowledge that um, that it exists. Um, one of the things I said in you know, and when, when I was talking with you is that I you know I think some of these decisions are 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 based on moral values, and. Um, I guess I'm getting really personal here, but my successor went to a Bob Evans, and um, he is one of the one of the folks that is behind this Senate Bill Five fight that's going on now in Ohio that's getting national attention, and um, and he used as his argument that uh, this this woman who served him food at, at Bob Evans um, uh, probably didn't make much money, and if she had uh, health benefits, they were probably shabby benefits. And so uh, why would she, as a, as a citizen of, of the state of Ohio, be supporting uh, benefits for public employees? Well, you know, I, I don't know what the implication of that observation is. That doesn't mean that everybody should have shabby benefits and, you know, and that we should, you know, just reduce benefits for everyone. Or another way you could look at it is that, you know, go to work and do everything you can to see that that woman who works at Bob Evans has reasonable benefits. And so you know, th th those, are, those are decisions that are economic decisions. They're ideological decisions. And, um, you know, they are there. You, you just gotta, you've got to work with them and try to do the best you can to sell your state and, and your workforce and the advantages of being in a state like Ohio rather than a state like Mississippi. Um, I think we have a higher quality of life. I know we have a higher uh, quality of education. Uh, I think our health care system is, is markedly better. Um, so it, it, it all depends on, you know, whether or not you consider all those factor, factors or if, if your only uh, object is to find the cheapest labor so that you can produce your product at the lowest cost. And th that's the, that is a, a push and pull that's going on throughout the world. Uh, and it's one that I don't know that we have completely um, come to terms with or found an answer to.
Thank you very much for your, for your comments. Uh, I'm a member of uh, Department of Commerce's uh, National Advisory Council on Innovation and Entrepreneurship, which the Secretary put together a, a year and a half or so ago. Yes. One of the things that we're trying to think about is what federal policies, uh, either existing and could be strengthened or new federal policies, might um, be particularly important to foster uh, regional development of the kind you've been talking about. And so, you, though you touched a little bit on that, I wonder if you could just make any comments you'd have on that. Yeah, I, you know, I also said that a national industrial policy is controversial. And, you know, I think your question is related to whether or not um, we think it is legitimate to try to uh, I identify uh, what's good for our economy and then uh, incentivize or provide resources or at least support for those, those, I mean, it, 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 I also said in my speech uh, that what's, what's good for um, the investor class is not necessarily what's good for the country. And I, I believe, and, and I'm diverting from your question here, but, but I just want to say this to you. I think one of the huge problems that we have uh, our, our quarterly reports, and 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 the, and the fact that uh, long range planning, uh, 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 I mean, it, it's mindless. That uh, major decisions would be made regarding compensating executives, for example, on whether or not they you know they have a strong quarterly report when decisions that they may have made leading to that particular report may be detrimental to the future um, well, well, well-being of the company. And I'm not an economist, and I'm not an attorney, and I'm a psychologist by training, so I can just, I can just say things without supporting data and be held <laughs> unaccountable. <laughs> so I can express an opinion. Um, and as a psychologist, I believe people should be able to express their, their opinions. Uh, <laughs> so, but but um, getting, uh, getting back to your question about uh, regional uh, support, um, what I would love to see is, is this administration or whatever administration is in power uh, em embrace the idea that manufacturing is a critical part, uh, should be a critical part of this country's economy and uh, see it in the broader context, not, not just because we want you know, jobs created in Ohio, but what kind of economy do we want? What kind of standard of living do we want? What can we do to really support and embrace uh, a strong middle class? A and, and national security has a big uh, piece of this as well. Um, so um, adopting a philosophy of, of, of the legitimacy of government involvement. And, you know, I, I mean, I there's a legitimate point of view that, that that's not appropriate. And, and I understand that, that that's, that's an ideological, ph philosophical, political um, uh, mixture of thinking. Um, but my, my point of view is that, the, that, that at the federal level, we should say manufacturing is important. It's, it, you know, we want it to be a continuing part of our economy and to recognize that throughout this big diverse country of ours there there are um, areas or regions where particular um, manufacturing um, uh, it, uh, you know is is especially prominent I mean you know I mentioned the the auto uh, companies um, I, I mean we were, I believe, on the verge of seeing a withering away of the American auto industry, and we don't know what may have come out of that. But as I was, as I was saying earlier, earlier today, uh, during that initial debate of whether or not there should be government intervention, I got a call from officials of Honda, because Honda has a huge manufacturing uh, operation uh, in Marysville, Ohio, near, near Columbus. And, and they called me on a Sunday uh, saying, Governor, can we meet with you? 
And so I invited them down to the governor's residence. And I'll, I'll never forget, we sat around that table, the dining room table. There were five or six of them. And uh, one of them said, you know, Governor, we don't normally advocate for uh, our, our competitors. But, you know, we're here to ask you to do whatever you can do to, uh, to see that this industry is helped. Because, why? They said 80% of our suppliers also supply the big three. And these suppliers are operating on the thinnest of margins. And we are afraid that we can see a cascading of the failure of our supply chain. And so that goes well beyond the big three, but it goes you know, to multiple um, industries that are related to this, this uh, auto industry. And, uh, you know, I'm aware of that because I'm from Ohio and, and, and so on, but I suspect that a lot of the debate that occurred in Washington at that time was, you know, was centered on things like, should we help these union, unionized companies or uh, uh, sort of superficial observations rather than a complete understanding of what was at stake here and how devastating it could have been. And so the auto industry was, you know, was a, a sector that was, that was shored up, I think, to gr good advantage. Investments are being made. Jobs are being created. And, and um, but there, there, you know, I mean, there, there are other areas um, in other regions of the, of, the, of the nation that could possibly be the focus of federal uh, involvement and in intervention or support. Um, uh, I'm just most familiar with the Midwest and with Ohio particularly. Uh, Governor, um, my name's Andrew Witwitzki. I'm a journalist writing in economic topics, formerly a diplomat. Your story about Ohio is remarkable for, for, for two special reasons. One is because you apparently were able to achieve political consensus at the state level to implement what amounted to an industrial policy, and that in itself is unusual. And then following up on that, you were able to actually make it work on the slate level, okay? Uh, you invoked China as an example. Germany was mentioned here. Two of the most successful economies on the globe today, it's, it's no accident that both of these countries have a very strong and muscular traditions of regional fiscal and economic management, ma management. Furthermore, manufacturing is a regional rather than a global phenomenon, mm -hmm. as in yeah. contrast to finance. Mm -hmm. So uh, is it, is it, is it ju wise and judicious for us to be looking to the federal government to implement effective industrial policy and to drive an economic recovery based on manufacturing, or should the action be on a state level? Well, I think it should be on both. And um, by the way, I'm, I'm going to Germany for six days in early December to try to learn more about what they're doing and, and how they've achieved what they've achieved. But, but um, uh, one of the things I said um, was that uh, after, after uh, President Reagan was elected, and, and, and I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not being political here because it was considered under somebody that I admire greatly, and that's President Clinton, and so on and so forth. But, but it wasn't only that we rejected the establishment of, an, uh, of, you know, of a national industrial policy. We, we actually undertook uh, policies, tax programs, and trade deals, in my judgment, that contribute to the deindustrialization of the country. It wasn't that we were just neutral. We actually went in the other direction. And, um, and when you're dealing with those kinds of issues, they are, they are large enough. They have to be dealt with at the federal level. A state, a, you know, a state doesn't have much um, to say about uh, trade policy. Uh, so that's a you know that's a federal issue that must be dealt with at the federal level. So I th you know I think it takes both uh, action at the federal and the state levels. Governor Strickland, we have worked you very very hard today, and 
I think at this point, we really should thank you. And oh, thank you.